The combustion version of Hyundai's second generation Kona looks much the same as the full electric model, but offers a more affordable and flexible option for someone in search of a trendily styled mainstream branded small SUV. Hyundai's compact Kona SUV has evolved in this second generation form. As before, there are mild and full hybrid options plus an EV. And all offer more space, greater sophistication and smarter looks. Sounds promising. Hyundai is perceived very differently now to the way it was back in 2017. And you could argue that the primary reason why is down to one model, the Kona small SUV, a car named after the Western district of the island of Hawaii. 2017 was the year combustion Konas were launched, but even more significant was the arrival of the full battery Kona Electric a year later, which along with its close cousin, the Kia e-Nero, kick-started EV sales in Europe. So the original Kona Electric's role in the Korean maker's SUV range was clear. The point of the original Kona combustion-powered model, though, became less obvious when Hyundai launched an almost identically sized small crossover, the Bayon, in 2021. This second-generation Kona design removes that model overlap, significantly longer, wider and taller than its predecessor, and better able to bridge the gap to the next model up in the brand's SUV range, the mid-sized Tucson. As before, it shares much with its similarly engineered Kia Nero cousin, including a new K3 platform. And also as before with the combustion models, there's a choice of mild hybrid or full hybrid powertrains, a wider range of options than many rivals offer. We're trying the full hybrid version here. For all Mark II Konas, as you can see, there's a much more avant-garde look, but will this and the many other changes made be enough to set this car apart in the overstuffed small SUV segment. Well, you'll need the industry's most comprehensive review, the car and driving road test to find out. Well, this is all a bit different, isn't it? An unremittingly black expanse of curved screen faces you as you get comfortable behind the wheel of this second generation Kona. But press the silver start button and the instrument part of the display gets populated with round gauge graphics to the usual Korean brand accompaniment of uh, slightly unnecessary chimes. If you've an automatic Kona like this one, it's not immediately obvious how to select a gear. The selector's been relocated to the right hand steering wheel stalk. Find that and you're ready. But for what? Nothing too out of the ordinary if the spec sheet is any guide. There's a new stiffer K3 platform shared like nearly all the mechanicals with this model's close Hyundai Motor Group cousin and nearest rival, the Kia Nero. But the chassis and suspension engineering that sits upon it is familiar as are the powertrains on offer, all units the brand has used in this model line previously. It's not quite the same recipe as a Nero. You get a couple of conventional petrol engines that aren't offered in that Kia. A mild hybrid, one litre, 120 PS, three cylinder, and a four cylinder, 1.6 litre, 198 PS power plant, both with the choice of either a seven speed DCT auto gearbox or Hyundai's IMT intelligent manual transmission, which decouples the engine from the gearbox after the driver releases the accelerator. Another more subtle difference over that Kia lies with the drivetrain in the Kona electric model. But the differences in comparison with the Nero EV aren't huge. A 65.4 kilowatt hour battery, 0.6 kilowatt hours bigger than the one in the Kia, and an electric motor with 218 PS, it's 204 in the Nero EV. That top Kona Electric offers a class leading potential 319 miles of range, or 212 if you get the car with a smaller 48.4 kilowatt hour battery that Hyundai also offers. 
We'll cover the Kona Electric for you in more detail in a separate film. It's a car that's evolved a bit. The Kona variant we haven't yet mentioned, the 1.6 litre full hybrid model we're trying here, hasn't, or not much anyway, which you might be a touch disappointed about given that this self-charging unit dates back to 2019 for Kona customers. Given the way that EV technology has progressed in that time, you would expect it to be very different indeed. Instead, there's basically the same smart stream 1.6 litre GDI petrol engine Hyundai's been using for a decade, putting out 141 PS in this form and mated to the same six speed dual clutch automatic gearbox driving the front wheels with the assistance of an electric motor. That motor is pretty much the same as previously too, developing 32 kilowatts as before, but unfortunately the tiny battery that powers it isn't, reduced in size to 1.32 kilowatt hours down from 1.56 kilowatt hours, which means it's even less likely to ever power the car on its own. That's not the point with a self-charging hybrid model like this, of course. The little battery is there to reduce the load on the engine, not to substitute for it in the way that a much larger battery would in an equivalent plug-in hybrid. A drivetrain that, curiously, Hyundai's chosen not to offer here, despite the fact that it was engineered for the Nero. Perhaps the brand was worried about weight. This ordinary hybrid model carries around 90 kilos more of that than the entry-level one-litre variant, which explains why its 0-62 to mile an hour sprint time of 11.2 seconds is only around half a second better than that supposedly feebler base version. That's en route to a Kona hybrid top speed rated at an unremarkable 103 miles an hour. And then only if you select the most urgent of the three available drive modes, Sport. The other two are Eco and Snow. A more significant element of this self-charging powertrain's character, though, is its relatively feeble pulling power, just 265 newton meters of torque which means overtakes must be planned well in advance. A typical Kona hybrid customer, though, would be doing that anyway. To overly criticise the performance and drive dynamics of a car like this, as you'll find plenty of media outlets out there doing, is to fundamentally misunderstand its basic remit. The likely owner of this car won't want or need more performance than this crossover can offer. And they certainly won't need tactile steering feedback and rewarding handling at speed through tight turns. So this Hyundai doesn't set out to provide it, though body roll is actually pretty well controlled by class standards and better managed than it is in an equivalent Nero. What likely customers will want is decent ride quality on the school run, easy steering for traffic and parking, and excellent refinement for the short bypass section of the ride home all of which this Kona delivers. It's that improved refinement and ride quality we've most noticed with this second generation model, both things that come courtesy of the stiffer, more sophisticated K3 platform we mentioned earlier. All flavours of Kona get this chassis, of course, but because the K architecture allows for conventional power plants and various battery mounting options, depending on electrified powertrain, centrally for the Kona electric and beneath the rear seats for this hybrid model, the variants each drive a little differently. That's influenced by suspension changes too. Both the 1.6 litre variants and the EVs get multi-link rear suspension. But because these models are weightier than the base one litre version, which does without it, you don't really feel the benefit of this more sophisticated setup. And you'll still keenly feel poorer tarmac tears and speed humps. In choosing between different Konas, you'd notice the biggest handling difference if at your local dealer's showroom you jumped out of this hybrid and took a drive in the full electric version. That's because the central sighting of that full EV model's hulking great 65.4 kilowatt hour battery improves its centre of gravity no end, reducing cornering body roll to an extent that's been promised with this Mark II hybrid model 
but unfortunately not delivered. As a result, from your relatively high set driving position in a Kona Hybrid, you're probably not going to be very often switching this centre console drive mode dial into sport. You won't really want to anyway, not only because ultimately it doesn't make the car go much faster, but also because it artificially raises the revs to a level that feels uncomfortable with an efficiency-orientated crossover of this kind, audibly negating the very sensible reasons why you chose one in the first place. Another reason not to select Sport is that it robs you of the ability to improve drive efficiency by altering brake regeneration. In Sport, these paddle shifters behind the steering wheel are there to shift the gears. In Eco, though, they have a completely different function for altering brake regeneration. This works via three different regen levels, the fiercest slowing the car quite noticeably. It's probably easier, though, just to trust the car's smart recuperation system, which does it all for you. An auto setting that automatically adjusts regen levels by measuring the distance to the vehicle ahead. All this is as much as you'll remember if you come to this Mark II Kona hybrid model, having familiarity with later versions of its predecessor. As we've been saying, beyond the technology tinsel, real drive differences with the second generation version of this self-charging Kona are difficult to discern. To find them, you really have to drill down into the detail. Like the fact that the engine now runs on low friction ball bearings and, more interestingly, that Hyundai's now taken out the mechanical reverse gear. Reverse motion is instead now delivered by the electric motor, helping to eliminate tailpipe emissions during reversing manoeuvres and giving the car the potential to go rather quickly backwards in the unlikely event you should ever want it to. One thing we're glad that Hyundai hasn't changed is the towing capacity, rated at a 1300 kilo braked figure that's higher than you'd expect for a hybrid. 100 kilos more than the base one litre model and nearly twice what you'd get with a Kona electric. Your best Kona option for towing, by the way, is probably the 1.6 litre non-hybrid model with 198 PS that we mentioned earlier. A car that in DCT auto form can get you to 62 miles an hour in just 7.8 seconds en route to 130, which is significantly faster than most customers will want to go. Kona sales with that engine, though, were vanishingly small before, and we wouldn't expect that to change this time round. Sales of this model as a whole, though, should take a useful step forward with this second-generation design. It looks fresher and thinks more cleverly. You can even set up this hybrid version to reduce its emissions in sensitive areas, like outside the school gates, for instance. The hybrid and EV versions get the latest version of the brand's Highway Drive Assist semi-autonomous driving system. Plus, top models can automatically brake themselves to avoid parking obstacles as well. In short, this Kona's evolved quite a bit more than the spec sheet might suggest. If you like the look, you might well like the car. As befits its changing era, this second generation Kona was developed first as an EV, then as a combustion model. Either way, it's quite a striking looking thing and very different to its predecessor. It's bigger too, 60 millimeters longer, 25 millimeters wider and 20 millimeters taller. Stylist, ex-Bentley designer Sang Yup Lee evidently decided that this Mark II model was going to be about as different from the original as it was possible to get. The easiest way to tell this combustion version apart from the EV model is here at the side, where angular black wheel arch cladding replaces the subtler body-coloured treatment of the electric variant. It's a distinctive profile, with an angular crease that runs from low down just behind the front wheel arch to the rear door handle. There's also a prominent central swage line emphasising the 4,355 mm body length and a silver trim strip under the glass house sweeps up to the top of the tailgate. You get roof rails. Most models feature these 18-inch wheels, though 17 and 19-inch rims are also available. And this contrast-coloured roof option will be popular. 
as will the sportier looking N-line versions. Back at the front, the twin creased smooth surface clamshell bonnet has a leading edge above a super slim full width light strip. The headlights and indicators sit in separate corner clusters and the combustion version is set aside from the EV by its use of this three-dimensional garnish and skid plate instead of a radiator grille. The rear is equally distinctive with light clusters built into the rear of the wheel arch trim. Another slim full width lighting strip stretches across the slab sided tailgate and there's a silver trimmed roof spoiler with a stoplight in the centre and a shark fin antenna just beyond. And it all sits on a new K3 platform that's currently the most advanced chassis Hyundai has for this class of car. So will it be as radical inside? Let's take a look. Well, yes, it actually is. This will be nothing like any other small Hyundai or previously have sat in. And it's vastly different from the rather cramped, plasticky affair served up in the previous generation model. Even that close cousin Kia Nero doesn't look very similar to this car behind the wheel. There's nothing very premium about the ambience, but as intended, it feels spacious, airy, and rather avant-garde. The first thing you'll probably notice is this on-trend curved dash top screen panel for the instrument and infotainment displays, which on this combustion model isn't quite as wide as it first appears because the far right hand side section of the fitting is taken up by a speaker. Beyond that, stylistic details throw themselves at you, all of it quite interesting, but none of it really fitting together as part of a cohesive design. Perhaps that's the idea. There's this strangely shaped wheel with its unusual oval center bezel, the angularly layered dash on the passenger side and the completely open center console that doesn't quite reach the center stack. On an auto model like this one, you'll initially look in vain for a gear selector. It's been relocated to a hidden stalk off the steering wheel. There are lots and lots of buttons for a modern era cabin, partly because Hyundai doesn't want to copy Kia's approach and use the same ones for screen and ventilation functions. For us, that works better and it helps that said buttons are of the proper sort. No haptic sensor switches or silly sliders here as you get in rival Volkswagen Group models. The brushed aluminium centre finish with a plastic trimming in the centre of the fascia might remind you of an early 2000s hi-fi and there's no padding on the door armrest where you'd naturally rest your arm. Otherwise though, there's not much to object to unless you happen to dislike the open plan feel. Materials quality has taken a big step forward with this generation and the things you regularly interact with like the door handles, the switch gear and the steering wheel now feel considerably more solid. We mentioned the screens, both properly sized. Hyundai isn't one of those brands that fobs you off with poverty sized displays further down the range. The 12.3 inch instrument TFT readout is clear enough Though what you initially might think are virtual circular gauges turn out to be digital speed and RPM readouts with curving coloured displays arcing above. On top models like this one, they become rear view cameras on each side when you indicate. Along the bottom of the display you get readouts for drive mode, temperature, gear selection and mileage. And in between these two digital dials is a center section, the content for which, counterintuitively, you control via a button on the left hand wheel spoke. Using this, you can view trip data, temperature, tire pressure, and on this hybrid model, an energy monitor. Everything else you'll need is to be found on this central touchscreen, which is 10.25 inches in size on a combustion model like this, or 12.3 inches in size with the electric model. Either way, like most infotainment monitors these days, it shows its information via customizable widgets, the main ones covering mapping, radio stations, and EV drive functions. Swipe across and other accessible widgets scroll across your view, including phone activation for the usual Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone projection, though it's not of the wireless kind. The surround view monitor fitted to this top model is helpful with side, back, and zeroed in overhead views, though the car graphics are somewhat unconvincing. And it's worth having the Bose sound system upgrade that comes fitted to top variants like this one because the speaker quality with the standard system is a little tinny. Navigation routes are calculated using a powerful server 
located in a blue link cloud which is continuously updating itself. And the screen's built-in dynamic voice recognition system, voice control, can deal with media and destination inputs, but still struggles with some simpler requests like finding a radio station. Climate controls, as we mentioned earlier, have been separated out from the screen and sit prominently lower down the centre stack, including Hyundai's usual and very useful windscreen auto defog function. Other centre screen features include voice memo, so you can dictate to the car as you drive. Plus, there's a valet mode, which via the car's Blue Link app can tell you how long and how far your Kona has been driven if you've given it over to be valet parked. There are Blue Link sections with calendar and weather applications. And you can even use this screen to follow scores from your favourite sports team. Hyundai Live features also brief you on traffic and parking availability. What else? Well, you're not perched particularly commandingly, but you do sit a touch higher than you would in a slightly smaller super mini based SUV. The seat's quite comfortable for the driver, has standard lumbar support, will be heated provided you've avoided base trim, and is complemented by plenty of steering wheel adjustment. An optional Lux pack adds a so-called relaxation comfort seat with what Hyundai calls weightless body pressure distribution to help alleviate fatigue on longer drives. Frontward visibility is fine, aided by narrow pillars and tall windows, but your over-the-shoulder view is somewhat obscured by the broad rear pillars and the small rear screen, so you'll be needing the standard rear camera and all-round parking sensors. That airy cabin vibe suggests plenty of interior storage space, particularly if you've chosen an automatic model like this one with this vast empty space between the seats. Part of this useful tray between these front chairs can be used by cup holders that click out with retractable stays. Just ahead, above the drive mode selector, is an open area that will include a wireless charging mat, provided you've avoided base trim, with twin USB-C ports and a 12-volt socket just above. Not all the storage features are as well thought out, though. The glove box is mainly taken up by the owner's manual, which you don't need because there's a digital manual on the centre screen. And this shallow tray above wouldn't be good for much. There's no conventional box between the front seat backs, just an open area with a lid and a lift-out tray. There isn't an overhead sunglasses compartment, but the reasonably sized door bins have bottle holders and there are ticket clips on the sun visors. Right, let's take a look in the rear. Now this is where basing the design of this second generation Kona on the full electric model ought to pay dividends. A longer 2,660 millimeter wheelbase was needed for that version, which should really help things here on the back seat. Sure enough, once inside, it feels very different to the cramped quarters served up by the previous generation model. The boxier area cabin design helps with that perception, as do these useful quarter light windows, though there's no panoramic glass roof option to further underline it. Legroom is usefully improved thanks to the 60 millimeter wheelbase length increase and helped by the seat back cutouts. If you're looking at a super mini based SUV like a Ford Puma or even something supposedly slightly bigger in this class, like a Volkswagen T-Roc, this is where you'll notice more space with this Hyundai. Having said that, you can really only still take a couple of adults comfortably back here, despite the relatively low transmission tunnel, this raised center seat cushion makes sure of that. When it's not being used, you can fold down this center armrest with its incorporated cup holders. Unfortunately, the seat base doesn't slide like it would do in a Volkswagen T-Cross or a Renault Capture. The seat backrest reclines, but only by one notch, and there's a coat hook, but only on the driver's side. There are no door bins, just bottle holders, and individual reading lights are missing as well. Still, unusually in this class, heated rear seats are standard, provided you avoid base trim. And in with the top two spec levels, you get three zone air conditioning, but Hyundai doesn't give you any digital controls for it to alter the temperature from the central vents, which have a cubby just below, featuring twin USB-C ports. 
Let's finish with a look at the boot, which will be accessed by this power operated tailgate, provided you avoid base trim. The hatch raises with a wide opening to reveal a 466 litre space. That's the same whether you specify a combustion or full EV powertrain. To give you some class perspective, that's 10 litres more than a Ford Puma, 15 litres more than an equivalent Kia Nero, and 21 litres more than a Volkswagen T-Roc. But it's nowhere near class leading. A Renault Captur, for instance, offers 70 litres more. Still, you can fit five carry-on suitcases and a couple of soft bags beneath a parcel shelf, which should be more than sufficient for most owners. There's an adjustable height boot floor with loads of space beneath it, though only because Hyundai doesn't offer any sort of spare wheel down here. With the cargo base in place, it's quite a usable space with a recessed area to the left, four tie-down points and plenty of bag hooks, two on the left and one on the right. Being able to click the rear seat backrest forward one notch could make all the difference when getting large suitcases in on an airport run, for example. If you need space to take longer items when you're carrying a couple of passengers in the back, you'll be glad of this convenient 40-20-40 seat back split. Though bear in mind that you don't get that with base advance trim, which makes do with a less convenient 60-40 split. When everything needs flattening, you might be disappointed that there are no cargo sidewall seat back retraction catches, but that's not unusual in this class. The usual seat shoulder catches feature, which as usual in a hatchback are quite difficult to reach when the parcel shelf is still in place. With everything flat, up to 1300 litres of space is available with all the different powertrain options. Right, lots to cover here. There are four Kona trim levels, Advance, N-Line, N-Line S, and as here, Ultimate. At the time of launch and of this film in autumn 2023, Hyundai was asking prices in the 26 to 32,000 pound bracket for the most affordable mild hybrid 1 litre T, 120 PS models. If you've a budget at the upper end of that spectrum and are looking at the two top trim levels, you'll be offered the chance to spend 1,800 pounds more and get the perkier 1.6 litre, 198 PS engine. All the combustion models are petrol powered, of course. Either way, and with all the trim levels, you'll be able to spend £1,800 more to upgrade yourself from manual to automatic transmission. Here, automatic transmission is mandatory because we've chosen to test the 1.6 litre full hybrid model, which offers 141 PS and as we filmed, was priced from around £30,000 or from around £34,000 in this top ultimate form. If that's still not efficient enough for you, then you'll need the Kona Electric, which at the time of filming in the 65 kilowatt hour battery form that almost everyone will want, was priced from just under 39,000 pounds. If that's a bit rich for your budget and you'll only need your Kona Electric for commuting trips, Hyundai offers this model with base advance trim with a smaller 48 kilowatt hour battery priced at around 35,000 pounds. The Kona Electric's not our focus here though, we cover that in a separate film. The combustion models that are have a vast number of potential rivals in the compact part of the SUV segment, the lower part of which this Kona represents the entire Hyundai Motor Group in, since its close cousin the Kia Nero isn't offered with the more conventional power plants that prop up the Kona range. With a 26 to 34,000 pound budget that from launch Hyundai wanted for the one litre and conventional 1.6 litre versions of this car, a customer in this segment would be choosing either an upper spec version of a super mini based SUV, like say a Ford Puma, a Peugeot 2008, a Volkswagen T-Cross or a Vauxhall Mokka, or a similar kind of budget would get them a lower spec version of a slightly larger, lower mid-sized SUV model of this sort, like say a Nissan Qashqai, a Seat Attica, a Vauxhall Grandland, a Volkswagen T-Roc or a Citroen C5 Aircross. Choose a budget brand model like an MG HS or a Sangyong Corando 
and you can pretty much have a bigger SUV for the price of a smaller one. But the downside in both cases is cheap finishing and poor efficiency. If your focus is on the full hybrid Kona we're looking at here, then the most obvious alternative class choice is the identically engineered Kia Nero Hybrid, which costs much the same. Finding other direct, similarly sized, full hybrid compact SUV rivals from other brands for these two cars isn't easy. The Honda Jazz Crossstar, the Nissan Duke Hybrid, the Renault Capture E-Tech Hybrid, the Lexus LBX and a couple of Toyotas, the Yaris Cross and the CHR are all a little smaller, as is the Suzuki Vitara full hybrid, which is more affordable, but just not efficient enough. If you're able to stretch your budget to the kind of money being asked for this top ultimate trimmed Kona hybrid, then your options would open out to include slightly larger hybrid compact SUVs like the Nissan Qashqai e-Power, which achieves its frugality rather differently, and the Lexus UX 250h. If, having considered all of these rival alternatives, you conclude that it is a Kona of some sort that you really want, then whatever version you choose, you should find it to be very well equipped. All variants get a smart look with body-coloured door mirrors and door handles, a rear spoiler, roof rails and front and rear skid plates. Plus, keyless entry, front and rear parking sensors, also headlights and wipers and alarm and cruise control upgraded to a smart system with auto stop and go on hybrid and DCT models. Interior features include a 12.3 inch driver's supervision cluster instrument screen, a rear view camera, dual zone climate control, an automatic rear view dimming mirror, driver's seat lumbar support, a windscreen defog function and front and rear USB-C charging points. Media connectivity is based around a curved centre screen that's 10.25 inches in size on combustion models and 12.3 inches if you choose the electric version. Either way, it offers the usual DAB audio system, Bluetooth, over-the-air updating and wired Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring features. More importantly, there's an extremely sophisticated navigation system which is updated with Hyundai's MapCare service and here can work with a clever cloud-based Blue Link connected routing feature. This sees driving routes calculated on a powerful server located in a Blue Link cloud, which allows for more accurate traffic forecasting, more precise times of arrival, and more reliable route recalculation. This works with incorporated Hyundai Live services which alert you to speed cameras and provide accurate information on traffic jams and roadworks. Staying with Blue Link technology, the central screen has a Blue Link connectivity section offering a calendar, weather reports, and vehicle diagnostics menus. There's even a part of it you can program to update you on scores from your favorite sports team. Remember though, that you'll need to pay a subscription for this setup after the first three years of use. And of course, there's an app. There's always an app, isn't there? Which, predictably, in this case, is called Hyundai Blue Link. This includes Hyundai's wide selection of connected car services, including a last mile navigation feature that'll take you on foot to your ultimate destination if you have to park the car a little way from it, as in a busy city, for instance. And if you've chosen the Kona Electric, it can manage your charging regime as well. Plus, of course, this app will do all the usual things that manufacturer model apps tend to do these days. You can send destinations from your home computer to your car. You'll be able to remotely lock or unlock the vehicle, and you'll be advised if the alarm goes off. Using the app via your phone, you can also access maintenance information on your Kona, send places of interest data to the navigation system, and use the Find My Car feature to find the vehicle in a crowded car park if, for some reason, you've forgotten where you parks it. If you've activated the central screen's provided valet mode, the app can also tell you how long and how far the car has been driven if you've handed it over to be valet parked. Valet mode also restricts access to personal information, your call log on the central screen, for instance. 
All of this comes included with base advance spec, as do 17-inch alloy wheels, upgraded to 18-inch rims on the hybrid version. The alternative to this base trim level, for those in search of something a little sportier looking, is N-line spec. This gets a dedicated front and rear bumper design, side skirts, 18-inch alloy wheels, twin exhaust tips, black gloss door mirrors, solar glass, body-coloured wheel arch inserts, rear privacy glass, and there's the option of a black roof. Interior features at this level include aluminium pedals and N-line cloth upholstery. Plus, from N-line spec onwards, you get heated front and rear seats, ambient lighting, a heated steering wheel, a wireless charging pad, and a powered tailgate. What about if you want something a little nicer? than the two mainstream Kona trim levels, which is what you'll need to be looking for if you want the perkier 1.6 litre, 198 PS engine we mentioned earlier. Well, in that case, you'll be choosing between extra sportiness with N-Line S spec or luxury with the ultimate trim level we're trying here. Both get a premium Bose sound system with seven speakers and a subwoofer, and Hyundai's so-called full-width horizon center daytime running light, along with full projection LED headlamps, and a surround view monitor camera system and a wider portfolio of safety and driver assistance features, which I'll brief you on in a moment. As for specific top-spec Kona model features, well, the N-Line S gets Alcantara and leather upholstery, heated, ventilated and electrical adjustable front seats, three-zone air conditioning and that Bose premium sound system with seven speakers and a subwoofer. Ultimate spec, meanwhile, gets you a sunroof and leather upholstery in black or grey. What about options? Well, your dealer is going to want you to look at the Lux Pack, which gives you an electric sunroof and the brand's new digital key, which uses near field communication to allow you to lock, unlock and start your Kona with either your smartphone or smartwatch. With auto transmission, the Lux Pack adds premium relaxation front seats that can be reclined right back and have memory settings. And on this hybrid model, the Lux Pack also includes remote smart park assist as well, allowing you to stand outside your Kona and park it using the key fob, which is pretty impressive. Across the range, you'll almost certainly have to pay your dealer extra for your choice of paint colour. There's a special solid Atlas white finish that we've got here and a selection of metallic and pearl paint finishes. Now you'll probably want the two-tone roof option available above base trim. Another aesthetic extras include the chance to add piano black or brushed aluminium optic exterior highlights, plus racing stripe decals, side trim lines, side skirts, and a choice of different wheel designs. For the interior, there are LED door puddle lights, LED door projectors, and door sill garnishing plates. As for practical features, well, you can add a tow bar upon which a twin bike rack can sit. And Hyundai also offers various floor mats, say front seat back hanger, a windscreen cover, door handle protection foils, mud flaps, and rubber coverings for the boot area and the rear seat back. That trunk mat can be reversible and you can add a foldable trunk organizer box and a rear bumper protection foil. Let's finish with a perusal of the safety stuff on offer across the range, which remains an area where this Hyundai continues to easily meet the class standard. The autonomous braking system, the brand calls its setup forward collision avoidance assist, has got a bit cleverer, now able to detect pedestrians and cyclists and able to function at junctions if you are about to turn out in front of an oncoming vehicle. And you'd expect some kind of lane departure warning system on a car of this price these days. And sure enough, with this Kona, you get two lane keep assist and lane follow assist. The latter working on auto models with the car's standard smart cruise control system and using a camera to keep the car centered in lane, working between naught and 81 miles an hour, alerting you if you drift over lane markings. Should you do that, the Lane Keep Assist system will apply subtle steering lock to ease the car back to where it ought to be. There's also leading vehicle departure alert so that in an urban queue, when the vehicle in front moves off, so will you. 
Should you happen to hit something, a multi-collision brake setup works after the impact, breaking the car so that it's less likely to go on and then hit something else. And an e-call system will alert the emergency services with your GPS location if the airbags go off in a collision. There's also a high beam assist system to automatically dip your headlights at night and a rear occupant alert feature that prompts you before you get out of the car to make sure you haven't left a child on the back seat, which globally every day happens more frequently than you might think. You can set a speed limit warning and activate speed limit assist, which will use the car's traffic sign recognition system to prevent you exceeding any posted limit. And driver attention warning will alert you if the car senses signs of drowsiness from the driver. All the usual passive safety features make the team sheet as well, of course. There are twin front side and curtain airbags along with a center side front bag in the dashboard. Plus you get Isofix rear child seat fastenings and active front head restraints that prevent whiplash. As usual with a Hyundai, there's the brand's VSM or Vehicle Stability Management System, which ensures stability when braking and cornering by controlling the car's ESC or Electronic Stability Control System if it detects a loss of traction. In addition, and as usual, with a family crossover of this kind, there's tyre pressure monitoring and hill start assist control to stop the car rolling backwards if you try and pull away on an incline. As you'd also now expect in this segment, the ABS anti-lock brakes are aided in panic stops by a brake assist feature plus an emergency stop signal that flashes the hazard lights to warn following motorists. Downhill brake control will ease you down a slippery slope and if you fit a tow bar, there's trailer stability assist to stop trailer snaking. Want more? Well, as mentioned earlier, if you stick to the two highest spec levels, your Kona will also come with plenty more safety and driver assist features. There's a blind spot view monitor, which alerts you if you're about to pull out when there's a vehicle in your blind spot. The same cameras provide rear cross collision avoidance assist, which warns you of oncoming vehicles when you're reversing out of a space. Safe exit warning which warns passengers about to open their doors of oncoming traffic. And with the top two trim levels, you'll also be thankful for a parking distance warning side feature and parking collision avoidance assist, which will search for potential collision hazards during low speed maneuvering. Things like children, pets or low walls, as well as adjacent vehicles. If something's detected that you haven't noticed, the car will automatically be braked to avoid it. With the full hybrid and electric models, there's a spot of semi-autonomous drive tech too, in the form of Hyundai's clever HDA, or Highway Drive Assist system. This setup maintains the speed set by the driver or the speed limit on the motorway, while at the same time it controls steering, acceleration and deceleration in your lane, keeping you a safe distance from the vehicle ahead. This feature is also designed to automatically adjust your speed based on the speed limit of the road detected through the navigation system. So if you have the speed set at 70 miles an hour on a motorway and the limit changes to say 50 miles an hour, the car will automatically lower its speed to suit. Clever. With this second generation Kona, the Highway Drive Assist setup also assists with safe lane changes on the motorway. With the driver's hands on the steering wheel and above a certain speed, a push of the indicator stalk is all that's necessary to move the car safely into an adjacent lane if the car identifies a suitable gap in the flow of traffic. In this form, the HDA system also works preemptively, gradually offsetting the car within its lane if another vehicle strays too close and looks likely to drift towards you. It's all very reassuring. Like its Kia Nero cousin, this second generation Kona can make all the style statements it likes, but if its cost of ownership figures don't stack up, then it won't sell. So, 
Hyundai's worked hard on this issue when it comes to the hybrid version we're trying here, which officially records up to 60.1 mpg on the combined cycle and up to 106 grams per kilometer of CO2. To give you some segment perspective, that's a fraction less than the equivalent Kia Nero hybrid, but virtually bang on the stats you'd get from a comparable Toyota CHR 1.8 HEV. Whether it's really worth paying the extra to get a Kona with this level of frugality is a decision only you can make. For comparison, the base 1.0-litre mild hybrid manages 48.7 mpg and 131 grams per kilometre, while the 1.6-litre 198 PS model returns up to 47.1 mpg and 136 grams per kilometre. We'd hoped that the base one litre version might do a bit better than that. A mild hybrid it may be, but like all MHEV units, it can't ever run independently on battery power. Instead, with this kind of setup, a belt-driven integrated starter generator replaces the standard alternator and enables the recovery and storage of energy usually lost during braking and coasting to charge a tiny 48 volt lithium iron air-cooled battery pack. The starter generator also acts as a motor, integrating with the engine and using the stored energy it harvests to provide extra pulling power during normal driving and acceleration, as well as running the vehicle's electrical auxiliaries and helping the power plant stop-start system in urban traffic. In contrast with the full hybrid Kona we're trying here, the engine is regularly able to run independently on battery power, though not for very long, thanks to the combination of a near 1.5 tonne curb weight, a relatively feeble 32 kilowatt electric motor, and the small size of the 1.32 kilowatt hour lithium iron polymer battery pack that powers it. If you want to run on electric power for longer, then your only other option is the Kona Electric Full EV. That model's not our focus here, but for reference, in volume 65.4 kilowatt hour form, it manages a range of up to 319 miles, a figure that falls to 212 with the rarer 48.4 kilowatt hour variant. Recharging the 65.4 kilowatt hour Kona Electric model from 10 to 80% at a public rapid charger can take as little as 43 minutes and topping up the battery from a 7.4 kilowatt garage wall box takes nine hours and 15 minutes, or six hours 20 if you've an 11 kilowatt supply. Back to this self-charging Kona hybrid. As you'd expect, there are lots of dashboard drive tools to help you maximize economy. You'll need to regularly engage the eco drive mode, of course, and there's a power meter dial on the right of the instrument cluster with charge, eco and power segments, plus a selectable central energy monitor so you can see in real time what's being powered by what. A larger version of that energy monitor can be seen in the hybrid section of the center dash infotainment display, better showing ongoing use of energy between engine, electric motor, battery and wheels along with graphical displays showing fuel engine use in MPG and electric motor use in kilowatts. That same screen's settings section has an eco vehicle screen which allows you to activate efficient coasting and smart recuperation settings. Make good use of all of this and the results can be impressive. Even when driving this car quite hard, we've struggled to record less than 40 miles per gallon throughout our test. There's more clever efficiency tech too, as in our Nero Hybrid, there's a green zone EV drive mode feature that's selectable in the same eco vehicle section that automates the drivetrain's use of electric power by taking location guidance from the navigation system and or driving pattern learning or manual driver input. Built-up areas or roads nearby schools and hospitals are designated within the GPS mapping as green zones, and upon entering them, the Kona Hybrid will automatically switch to electric-only driving to reduce exhaust emissions. You can also take control of green zones along your route by setting other areas in which you might wish to reduce this Hyundai's emissions, such as around your neighborhood or outside the school gates. Brilliant. 
Right, on to issues of VED road tax. Again, there are advantages here with this hybrid drive. For this HEV full hybrid model, you'll pay a £170 annual fee. Benefiting kind taxation is rated at 26%, obviously way above the 2% figure applied to the Kona Electric, but usefully better than the figures you'd be liable for with the more conventional engines from 31% with the 1 litre or from 34% with the 1.6. You'll also want to know about likely depreciation with a volume brand badge crossover of this kind of price. Well, that's reasonably class competitive. Industry experts reckon that after three years and 36,000 miles, the Kona hybrid model we're trying here would still be worth between 55 and 58% of its original value, which is very class competitive. The Kona electric, by the way, doesn't fare quite as well, rated at around 51%. Insurance is grouped 16 to 18 for either the 1 litre model or this hybrid. It's grouped 25 to 28 for the 1.6 litre, group 25 for the Kona Electric 48 kilowatt hour, and group 31 to 33 for the Kona Electric 65 kilowatt hour. Servicing is required every year or 10,000 miles, whichever comes first. If you want to budget ahead for routine maintenance, there are various Hyundai Sense packages that offer fixed price servicing over two, three or five year periods. You can pay for your plan monthly and add MOTs into the three or five year plans for an extra fee. Usefully, the car's centre screen has a vehicle diagnostic section that allows you to check various maintenance functions between services, the brakes, the indicators, the steering, camera safety systems and tyre pressures. As for ownership peace of mind, well, you get Hyundai's usual comprehensive five-year unlimited mileage warranty, which is far better than the rather mean three-year deal that quite a few rivals in this segment offer, though Toyota has a 10-year warranty package. The Hyundai warranty is backed up by 12 months of breakdown cover and five years of free annual vehicle health checks. True, a similarly engineered rival, Kia Nero, claims to better this package by offering a seven-year warranty deal, but there you're limited to 100,000 miles. With this Hyundai, there's also a five-year annual health check, a three-year MapCare navigation update program, and a 12-year anti-corrosion warranty. For the Kona Electric, there's a separate eight-year or 125,000 mile warranty for the battery. This is linked to a minimum capacity caveat, which means that any required repairs will return the battery to at least 70% of its original capacity. Cars of this kind tend to be more about style than substance, and sure enough, this Kona is certainly designed to make the appropriate statement in the gym car park, especially in this smarter, more confident looking second generation form. But this car is more than just a fashion statement. There's a spacious cabin, decent efficiency, plenty of equipment and a comprehensive warranty, which the first generation Kona also had, hence its strong sales figures. To these attributes, apart from more striking looks, this second generation model adds better driving dynamics and extra technology. It may not have been primarily developed with an engine beneath the bonnet, but even in this combustion form, it's a very complete package. Of course, you may not like the divisive new shape and want a slightly more premium feeling cabin. Plus, prices here have risen significantly over the previous model. And we're not totally sure that this full hybrid version provides quite enough over the base three-cylinder model to justify its price premium. Otherwise, most of the criticisms you could make apply to just about every other model in this fashionable segment. Adding weight and height to any car won't help its efficiency or drive dynamics, though this one deals with that compromise better than most which is important because the Kona faces enormous competition in a market sector that currently every mainstream brand wants a part of. So does this car now have what it takes to make an impact? 
Well, most agree that it's been styled to do so, which in this segment is half the battle. The Kona Electric might be the headline maker in this model line, but this commoner combustion version now has both the style and the substance to stand out a little more in its segment, which for its target market is all it really needs to do.